The new VW GTI is still the sport compact benchmark. The new WRX is the same aggressive all-wheel drive rally wannabe that it's always been. Today, I'm going to help you and myself decide which one is better. If you enjoy fun, detailed car content without fluff, consider subscribing and hitting the bell for notifications. The GTI next to me is a 2023. For 23, we have standard performance LED headlights and a 40th anniversary spec that slots between the S and SE. Price-wise, these are similar, though the WRX and GT form will demand much more money than the GTI would. And you do get a lot more features for the money with the VW. Even in its cheapest form, this thing has rain-sensing windshield wipers, front and rear parking sensors, heated exterior mirrors, and fog lights, some of which aren't available on the WRX or you have to pay more for. At least the Subi comes with LED headlights as standard, as does the GTI, but the VW adds helpful turning lights that are integrated into the headlights. The limited WRX gets steering responsive LEDs. For both cars, proximity unlock and lock comes on all but the base. When it comes to the aesthetics, these are polar opposites in the class. So I'm really not going to talk about it other than that I prefer the GTI. And I don't hate the WRX. This isn't something that matters too much to me. But what do you guys think? One little touch I like about the GTI a lot is the uh, cargo hatch door. It also like flips for the reverse camera. And for the WRX, if you look really closely, you'll see a ton of tiny divots in the body cladding, which Subaru says is for aerodynamics. So when you think about it, the WRX is more like a golf ball than the golf. For a full list of features and my detailed thoughts, you can check out my individual reviews on each one of these cars. But just to give you a taste, the GTI comes with heated seats, a heated steering wheel, lumbar adjustment, and wireless charging all on the base trim. Some of those aren't even available at all on the WRX. And I can assure you, as you climb the trims here, like this SE with the leather package, the distance between the two grows even more, though for the money at the higher trims, the material choice is not great, and they got rid of a vast majority of your analog controls, buttons, and dials, you're left with a more frustrating experience, especially when you just try to use the climate control. Uh, these sliders don't light up at night, and there's no capacitive feedback on anything in the center. The steering wheel, which has a really nice grip to it, and I like the perforation, the shape of it, it has capacitive controls on the steering wheel itself, which do offer feedback. But if you're aggressively driving it and you're not used to the car, you can definitely uh, on accident hit it. I you know, turn on the heated steering wheel, but word on the street, VW may be backtracking this here soon. I will say the UI, which can be buggy and has an unintuitive layout for the settings, does offer a high degree of customization and the screen looks pretty nice. And you also have a standard digital driving display that does offer a good amount of configurations. So if you wanna save a little bit of money and you want a volume and tune dial, get an S trim because it has both of those things. Briefly, I'd like to thank the friendly people at Royal on the East Side in Bloomington, Indiana for letting me test drive these two. The staff there are knowledgeable and their new inventory is never over sticker. If you're looking for any VW or Subaru, check them out. So you get an impression that the GTI is more tech oriented, it's more feature oriented, but it also nails the ergonomic points too. You have a shifter that's not very far away from the steering wheel and great seats. Yes, you will have fabric unless you go Audubon or you opt for it on the SE, but these are nice seats. They're soft where they need to be. They have enough bolstering to keep you tucked in through corners. And despite being sporty, they're not too aggressive. So I feel like if you're a little bit wider, this will still work. And they're super supportive. You have a steering wheel that tilts and telescopes, which is normal, but it can come out really far. So if you're six foot three like me, you'll find a really good driving position in the GTI, better so than what you'll get in the WRX. Plus you have great levels of storage in here. You can fit a giant water bottle here in the big door pocket, and it's also lined with felt. You also have an adjustable height for your center console here. And when you hop in the back, things become even more impressive. I also have more than enough headroom and standard rear vents and USB ports. The trunk, while short, is very tall. When you fold down the rear seats, you have a usable little box of space. And it's really just a testament to how well packaged the Golf and the GTI are and always have been. I will admit, this is a base trim WRX I have here, but I have driven the most expensive spec as well. 
even though that was $5,000 more than the GTI I have today, it did not match the VW in luxury or comfort. But I can see one main advantage coming out of the WRX. That the tech feels less frustrating and it does offer a more analog experience, which for some people is very important. You have things like a manual parking brake. No matter which trim you get, you'll have volume and tune dials with physical buttons to quickly control the temperature of the automatic climate control. Here with the base, you'll actually have a dual seven inch setup, whereas others will come with a 11.6 inch screen. All have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, but none offer wireless like you'll get with the GTI SE. The materials in here like the GTI are cheap, but as you go up through the trims, they do get a little bit better. Like here, I mean, everything is just kind of covered with a hard touch plastic. At least in the GT, you know, I had like suede inserts around the cabin, more stitching, and none of that's really present here except for on the seats. However, this feels like an interior that will endure abuse better and has a sturdy construction. The analog gauges are standard on all, and it reminds you that the focus of the WRX is to perform, not to impress your passengers or fuel your rage for the material world. The WRX also has sensible traits like okay interior your storage, large windows, and soft elbow rest points with the optional adjustable console lid. Definitely buy that. Despite four different trims, you will either get cloth or suede. No leather upholstery is available. The seats themselves are supportive, good for back road shenanigans and highway use, but not as well sculpted for me as the GTI. Plus, lumbar adjustment comes on the limited trim only. This was not intended as a luxury car. You have good seats, you have a meaty steering wheel, you got a big hand handbrake, and a nice shifter with analog controls. That's it. If you're the type of person where that's all you want, the WRX will not disappoint. My biggest gripe is that the large, just okay infotainment system with integrated HVAC controls detracts a little from the straightforward appeal. Moving behind myself though, again at six foot three, I have just enough legroom in the WRX if I'm not being excessive in the front seat, though my headroom is compromised and the trunk is not very tall, but at least it has some length to it and they really maximize all the available space. I should also note the GTI has a spare tire, the WRX does not. Underneath the hood of the WRX, we will have a 2.4 liter twin scroll turbocharged Boxer 4, an engine orientation that will reduce the center of gravity. It makes 271 horsepower, 258 pound-feet of torque. And while I would never call this engine a disappointment, I think that some people could find themselves a little bit let down by the lag, but it still kind of builds into the personality of the WRX's powertrain one that I overall find pretty entertaining. Most of these cars will come with a six-speed manual transmission, although you can get a continuously variable transmission as well that Subaru labels the Subaru Performance Transmission. It will do a pretty good job at mimicking an eight-speed dual-clutch transmission, but it still struggles with off-the-line performance and doesn't have all of the visceral feeling. Nice little uh, hill start here with a guy right up on my ass. Even after it disengages the brakes from the auto hold, it's very easy to modulate this clutch, something that I couldn't say about the previous generation. And it honestly makes the six-speed manual a pretty enjoyable experience. It also comes with a different all-wheel drive setup than the automatic. So this uses a viscous LSD in the center, and this typically delivers a 50-50 torque split, but it can transfer more to either axle when wheel slip occurs. The result is a car with an aggressive grip of the road at all times, and also providing for crazy hard launches, depending on how much you want to beat up the car. I just want to see what we can do with one quick acceleration test. We got a result there of six seconds flat. I was not trying to clutch dump that thing. You can do mid fives in here if you're willing to beat the snot out of it, but that's not really the purpose of the test today. And I don't think you're gonna drive this thing like that in the real world. The highway pulling power in this is phenomenal. It doesn't seem to die down at 50 or 60 miles per hour. It's really quite fun, especially on less than perfect roads because you begin to appreciate all the traction this thing has to offer. I'd also like to mention this is very little rev hang. And it revs up very quickly too. 
With the transmission, you have close ratios, an easy to operate clutch, and quite short throws if you get the STI short shifter, uh, which many will be equipped with that as an accessory. Without it here in my car, they're still not long and they preserve that notchy feeling. I think it again works with the overall vibes of the WRX. Now here on some smoother back roads, the WRX is not race car stiff, but it does have its body motion well under control. You can correct yourself mid corner, um, you know, speeds in excess of 60 and it does not make you doubt yourself. The steering has a quick ratio and when you don't have very much body roll, it causes the car to have this uh, low latency feeling, making it very competent, but that doesn't necessarily mean more fun. The steering itself is just mostly numb. I don't think it's terribly weighted, maybe on the light side a bit, but it gets really light and vague close to center. Now, I already mentioned the low center of gravity benefit with the engine's orientation. One big pro to that is that they don't need to spring this super stiff in order to give you uh, less body roll on windy corners. It's still a firm riding car, but here on this kind of abused back road, I'm not being abused myself. In fact, it also kind of comes into its element even more because we have a car that's composed. Take it through the worst of corners and it's not only forgiving, it's also in control at all moments and feels ready to attack. It's still not the most supple car out there. And if you want something a little bit more firm, you can get the GT trim, which will come with adaptive dampening. I didn't really think it made it noticeably more comfortable, but I do think it made it more appropriate for uh, spirited driving. Another aspect making this easy to live with is the visibility. For a sedan, you have a big windshield, low belt line, which honestly adds to the uh, hyper-confident feeling of the WRX on any roads. Bringing ourselves up to highway speeds at 65 or looking at 2,400 RPMs, so revving out a little on the high side there, but I definitely choose having aggressive gearing in a car like this than low cruising RPMs. I would not call it quiet. At, you know, the $31,000 price point we're looking at here in the base trim, this is acceptable, but at $43,000 with the GT, it's a notable complaint. And the GT trim itself was a letdown for me due to that cost and how it is available only with a CVT, a well-calibrated one, but it still falls far short of the excellent DSG dual clutch in the VW GTI. Today, I have the stick. And now that I'm in the VW GTI, I can attest that the visibility in here is quite good too. Maybe it has a slightly higher dashboard than the WRX, but the windshield does feel closer. I don't see it being a complaint on either front, but I will say that I think objectively the two liter turbocharged engine in the GTI feels a little bit more honed in for this kind of vehicle and has more guts than I was expecting. So you have 241 horsepower here, uh, but more importantly, 273 pound-feet of torque. Also, really good response from the little iron block EA888 engine. It's of course a two liter turbocharged unit, direct injected. VW has been using it for quite some time. It'll be hooked up to either a six speed manual transmission like I have here, or a seven speed dual clutch, which is phenomenal. That'll have really quick shifts, launch control, which is kind of surprising to see in a front wheel drive car, and almost like second nature tuning, especially when in the sport modes. With either transmission setup though, you will have a VW's VAQ E limited slip differential. Obviously this is front wheel drive only. If you want all wheel drive, you'll have to go to the Golf R, which is going to start around $14,000, $13,000 more expensive than this. One thing I am impressed by is the clutch feel in here. It's uh, definitely telling me what's going on. It's weighted very nicely, maybe a touch springier than the WRX and maybe has a, a more narrow bite point there. So I think driving these back to back, the WRX may be the easier car to drive on like a hilly city street. The shift throw feels similar in length to the WRX, but the feel is much smoother with subdued feedback as you enter each gate. I think I prefer the WRX manual as a whole, but this is still fun and refined. It seems like the gear ratios are a little bit taller than what I found in the WRX. So that should make our acceleration test kind of interesting.
man, it really starts to come alive there once you get into the higher speeds. But I was half throttled trying to make sure that it wasn't spinning its wheels in first. So the result there kind of trying to fight traction here in this cold weather was 6.3 seconds. So about 0.2 seconds away from what I got with the DSG. Once you get this thing up to a little bit of speed, it really rockets off. This has a lot of torque and the throttle response, the lag, it's just a little bit less than the GTI. When it comes to comfort, I think that the WRX definitely doesn't prioritize it, but it takes that more into consideration than it did before. But the GTI has always cared about your spine, and the new one does just a little bit more so than the Subaru. Even here, with the static suspension setup, and I also think the more comfortable seats uh, build into this as well. Throwing it around, again, the same corners with uneven, broken pavement, this thing is still very composed, it's telling me what it's doing. The car is shorter in length. It comes off as a little bit more playful while also being more supple. We have it in sport mode. The revs pick up quite nicely. The steering is definitely more communicative. A Little bit of pops and bangs from the exhaust there. Easy to heel toe downshift. I'm definitely finding myself with a bigger smile than I did in the WRX. The body roll feels similar. Once you start to get up to higher speeds, the WRX feels just a touch more uh, planted. I can still make corrections mid-corner and feel confident in myself. The Subaru just maybe comes off a little bit more glued. If I took this out on the track, I may have different opinions. I'm not driving these things 10 tenths out here, but I don't need to. And I'm going to have more fun in this when you're not pushing it to the limits than I do the Subaru. The steering is more communicative. There's better feedback. It does have uh, less vagueness on center. And it can go from eating up a nice back road to protecting you on a neglected one just like that. Plus, at 65 miles per hour, this is going to rev around 2100, 2200 RPM. So it's a little bit lower than the WRX. And it's also a touch quieter, though not luxury car rivaling. You also have to go automatic if you want to get any active driver aids like adaptive cruise or lane assist with the Subaru, whereas that comes all as standard with the GTI. Plus, if you go with the WRX, you're going to have some pretty poor gas mileage, at least when it comes to the EPA ratings. And that's rated for premium fuel, whereas the GTI it will take regular and it gets considerably better gas mileage. Now, as the owner's manual will state, the WRX can be run on regular if premium is not available. Though they also say if you notice any kind of issues like pinging or knocking, you should throw in premium. So if it's me as an enthusiast who really cares about my car, I'm probably just gonna throw in the higher octane. Which means the WRX will likely carry a higher running cost even considering reliability and maintenance, though the resale could reverse that. I go into further detail in my individual reviews, but both of these had prior generations with good reliability outside of the first few years. I'd give the leg up to the WRX for now, but I wouldn't personally be scared to buy either. You can also equip the GTI with a adaptive dampening if you go Autobahn or 40th anniversary, but I view the regular setup as great with less to go wrong. As a sport compact or hot hatch, the GTI is better. It may not come out as quicker on most roads, but it is more engaging on a back road. It's more comfortable and quiet yet rowdy when you want it to be. It has a usable back seat, good cargo area, and great features. A hot hatch is supposed to be fun and easy to live with. The GTI is exactly that. It checks all the boxes, but the tech is more frustrating and front wheel drive is a limitation for a lot of folks, including myself. Which is partially why I personally lean toward the WRX. Yes, it lacks the amenities, the talkative steering, the gas mileage, and the hatch, and the quiet comfy cabin, but it also doesn't fall flat on its face in most of those regards. It's still a brute, but now softer on bad roads and easier to drive while packing a stout powertrain full of character and pent up rage. Plus, the all-wheel drive and planted suspension make the thing feel unfazed over any road I tossed it through. The GTI wins the mind and the heart, quite frankly, but the WRX still appeals to the inner confrontation-seeking teenager. And sometimes, the latter has a stronger voice.
Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like to help me flex on the YouTube algorithm. If you want to see more, subscribe and hit the bell. And thank you to my loyal patrons. I'll catch you in the next one.